everybody. Happy Friday and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is The Daily Show, where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is your Collider Movie Talk crew. First up, senior producer John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. Drinking Coors Light? Why don't you just tattoo lightweight on your forehead? <laughs> <laughs> but I drink a lot of them. It's, it's the volume that I consume that makes it cool. Don't try that at home, kids. Yeah. Oh, shame. Okay. <laughs> also here, writer-director John Schnepp. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to drink like 20 or 40 <laughs> like Ellis, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> also here, the lightweight himself, Mr. Mark Ellis. I brought six Coors Lights to the studio today because if they release the Star Wars trailer, I was going to have to do oh, the cinnamon challenge, what? and they didn't, so I don't have to do the cinnamon challenge. If I had to, I was going to wash my mouth out with the delicious. Hey, this show, Funny. I still got 35 minutes to the end of the show for that Star Wars trailer to That's drop, right. damn it. it. drop at any moment. Oh, it's funny. All right, so moving on. Despite the fact that his show Hannibal has been canceled and is about to air its last last episode, actor Mads Mikkelsen seems to be in high demand. It was already announced that Mikkelsen will appear in the upcoming Star Wars Rogue One next year, and now it seems we're going to see him in the Marvel Cinematic Universe as well. According to a report in Variety, Mikkelsen is currently in talks with Marvel to appear in the upcoming Doctor Strange in an unknown villain role. As many of you will remember, Mikkelsen was at one time up to play the role of Malekith in Thor The Dark World a few years ago before the part went to Doctor Who star Christopher Eccleston. John, do you think Mickelson would be a good fit for Doctor Strange? Yes. Yes, I do. I think very much he would be a great fit for Doctor Strange. I I mean, I, I've seen him in a number of things before. And of course, obviously, he's the villain in uh, Casino Royale, in, in which he was fantastic. And everybody kept talking about how good Hannibal was. You, is particularly, I remember you told me a number of times, I really got to check out Hannibal. So last week, home one night, Anne's out, doing something with some friends. I said, yeah, all right, I'll put on Hannibal. And I watched the whole first season in about three days. And it's like, this guy has such a presence. And it's not just the voice. And it's not just his face. And it's not just his mannerisms or how he carries himself. It's all of it put together. This dude owns a screen when he is on it. He just, you, you cannot take your eyes off him because of what he emotes. It's incredible. Having him play not just any villain. Like, you name him for any villain role, I say yes, yes, yes. A villain in Doctor Strange, that reeks of perfection. It just sounds amazing. So, yes, I would absolutely be all on board for this. What about you, Schnapp? I love it. I mean, he's one of my favorite actors. Uh, if you haven't seen Valhalla Rising, it's like almost mm -hmm. no dialogue. It just relies solely almost on shots of his face seething with anger. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great <laughs> film. And he's a great actor. And I love Hannibal. So I, I was really pissed that they canceled Hannibal because right. they're like, well, come on. But uh, to hear that he's going to be a Doctor Strange, that just ratcheted it up. They've got, you know, Benedict Cumberbatch, Tilda Swinton. Uh, Chuitel Edgy Chuitel Edgy Edgy Four. And now, and now this guy, it's a... I, you know, everyone's saying he's going to play Dormammu, who's like this uh, villain, you know, in Doctor Strange. He's one of the most powerful villains. He's got well, that's a speculation. Head. I haven't heard anybody I, my say My speculation is he's going to play a character called Nightmare. That's just my guess. Because it would almost be like it's just too easy for him to be Dormammu. So I think they would spin it and maybe try this other character. But who knows? Any any character he plays, he's going to make it amazing in this film. So I, I'm happy. Yeah, I mean, how's this for a career checklist where you go Bond villain into playing Hannibal into being in a Star Wars movie and now part of the Marvel Cinematic right. Universe? And as Sinead mentioned, <laughs> I, am, not a bad day. <laughs> I am thrilled that he wasn't cast as Malekith because I think his powers could be used more in something like Doctor Strange that has an air of mystery to it, an air of the unknown, some mystical power that he can create. Now, obviously, with Thor, there's a lot of stuff you can do on Asgard, but this seems more like the right fit for him. And he's going to be playing a bad guy again. As we talked about on Jedi Council on Wednesday, he's probably not playing a bad guy in Rogue One. So I'm yeah. interested to see that shade of his ability, but we know this guy can be evil when he wants to. Him being in the Marvel Universe goes together like Mark Ellis and Light Beer. This is the <laughs> right play. You know, it was funny because on Jedi Council, I was saying, you know, because we heard that he's probably not going to be a villain in Rogue One. I was like, I kind of wanted to see him as a villain. But knowing that he's going to be, or at least it looks like he's going to be a villain in Doctor Strange, now I'm excited about him not being a villain in Rogue One. So he is, we're going to get a good dose of him as a villain, and now we can see him do something else, so that's exciting too. 
Hey, listen, folks, before we get to the next item here for the, our Inside Out story, another news item dropped a little bit earlier today that's going to have a lot of video game fans very excited. You know, whenever the topic of video game movies come up, one of the names that comes up a lot is Borderlands. When is they going to do a Borderlands thing? Well, according to a report coming out right now, Lionsgate has picked up and is going to be developing a Borderlands movie, apparently with the producing team of uh, Avi and Ari Arad. We're going to be doing this together. Together. Now, I have never myself played the Borderlands game. You have yep. another person on staff here. Wendy has Wendy. Let's let's get you to come up here quick because I know Wendy's yeah. played all the Borderland games. So, Schnapp, why don't we just kick it off with you? Talk a little bit about uh, the Borderlands game itself and if you think it's going to lend itself well to being a uh, being a film. I think it'll lend itself great to being a film. I mean. It's sort of like Mad Max Fury Road before we got Mad Max Fury Road. That's how Borderlands was to me. It was like you're in this post-apocalyptic world. You got a bunch of nutty, crazy creatures. Uh, it's it's a threat-based game. You have to go out into the wilderness and fight these kinds of bonker guys. They're really hard to kill, and the little midget <laughs> ones are even harder to kill. They are hard. So yeah, they're harder. You yeah. think it's ah, it's a little like tiny real guy. Real life, the little midget ones. Yeah, the midgets are way stronger than normal. Um, so yeah, I, I, it's a very fun game. I was talking to Wendy. He's like, "What's that little robot called again?" The and clap it's trap. clap trap. So why it's don't like you talk smart, about the clap trap? Is like a smart Alec R two D two. Yeah, which which was the best part about the first game, and then for the second one, they kind of made. I just only played not, the first oh, really? game, so yeah. I'm actually stuck right now on the pre sequel. I I because I'm working here. John chains me to my desk, and I can't do anything <laughs> else. I can't you get about ten games. minutes a day. Why are you complaining? <laughs> Let me ask you guys this: Why is this fit for a cinematic retelling? Like, is it because Mad Max was so popular that they want to take a game that feels a lot like that post-apocalyptic sandy world? I I think so for sure. I think because Mad Max Fury Road was so popular, like what other video games are like that? And that character right there is on everybody's yeah. cosplay list. I saw like at least six of those at San Diego Comic Con. I've seen every Comic Con this year. I've seen somebody dress as that character. So. Yeah. It's a, it's got a really great visual look to it. It's different from Mad Max, but it's still a post-apocalyptic world, and it's also different from uh, Fallout. So mm -hmm. I, th I think it's gonna it's gonna do really well as a movie. Yeah, I think especially following the success of Mad Max. I remember when I was watching Mad Max, and I leaned over to my husband. And I was like, "Honey, I want to play Borderlands when we got home." <laughs> exactly, and, and we did. Yeah. It's the same setting, and I don't feel like they necessarily even have to keep the four vault hunters. Like mm -hmm. like they they can have their own storyline, just setting it on Pandora with the vault hunters. Because I think if you follow it too closely to the game, it's going to come out a little cheesy, to be honest with you. It, it's, it, But I think if they take the core storyline and then develop that and make their own characters and keep Handsome Jack because he's the best villain ever. Because he, John said once that the worst villains are the ones who think they're doing right and they don't think they're doing anything. They don't understand that they're doing something bad. Um, and they truly believe what they're doing is actually for the good. And Handsome Jack is just one of the best video game villains I have. Because I hated him. I remember playing the game. Something happened. He, anyways, I looked at the screen. <laughs> I looked at the screen, and then I tears formed in my eyes. I got so mad, and I was like, I'm quitting. And I didn't play for two weeks. Yeah. I couldn't pick it up. It was, I was. Yeah. I threw my, my uh, controller at the wall at one point. Uh, <laughs> It was when you're like stuck in a car and you can't get the the vault door open. Yeah, I was like stuck on that for four days. That's just because I'm stupid as well. Did you so. hit the green button on the side? No, I didn't. That's the <laughs> danger with wireless controllers. You can really chuck those things a long way. It's not like Nintendo where it's <laughs> yeah, just like yeah, you can like, like wrangle it right, back. Right. It's like nope. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, it, yeah. It, it makes sense for Lionsgate to pick up this property, too, because they are coming off the Hunger Games, which is such a successful boom for that for that studio that now they need something to replace that because obviously the last mm -hmm. Hunger Games film comes out in November, so this could be the thing that catapults them and continues the legacy of Lionsgate. You'd hope so. Yeah, it's really exciting. Now now that they've announced it, it'll be fun to see who they start casting the world with. So Mads Mickelson, baby. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thank you for contributing, Wendy. Appreciate yeah. that. All right, what's next? Well, speaking of post-apocalyptic war movies, as Pixar was getting ready to release their latest animated feature, <laughs> Inside Out, many thought the movie looked brilliant, but that it could suffer financially due to the uniqueness of the film, the subject matter, and how difficult it could be to market properly. Well, yesterday the film crossed the $700 million worldwide mark, with $343, um, $343 million coming from the domestic box office alone. The number will get bigger as 
that still hasn't opened yet in Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Singapore, Germany, Italy, and China, which it will be very soon. Mark, considering how many people worried how well Inside Out could do, why was it able to succeed on this level? I mean, it's still a Pixar movie. Let's not forget that. It's not some yeah. small indie cartoon that's coming out. This is Pixar. This is the monster animation studio right now. More than that, I feel like Inside Out had a lot of replay value to it, where you'd want to go multiple times to check out exactly what's going on in the inner workings of the mind going to the subconscious and all the different adventures that Joy Sadness and the rest of the emotions went on. It was a funny movie. It wasn't quite, my only complaint about Inside Out is that it wasn't quite as funny as I thought it might be with that talent, but it told such a good story and it was such a great way for parents to take their kids and to teach them this is how you should process your emotions. Like, we're using too much anger, let's use joy instead. It's a conversation I hope I never have to have with my kids because I don't have any. Like to keep it that way, but the movie itself I thought was phenomenal and it deserved the repeat uh, business it got. Yeah, this I'm very pleasantly surprised at the success because it it still is right now my favorite movie of the year. I, th I think this is the best movie of the year so far up to this point. But even after I saw two years ago, I saw the the first 15 minutes in uh, CinemaCon in Las Vegas, and I was blown away by it, completely blown away by it. Knew it was going to be good but that it was gonna have a really hard time selling. This is an odd concept to sell to the public. And I remember we, the same kind of conversations came out when um, Wally was coming out. A lot of people thought, yeah, I don't, not, the, 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 the thing doesn't even talk, and you know, what's going on, can you sell this? And we know how Wally did. I think just word of mouth about how quality this movie is got out. I think you're absolutely right about the rewatchability of it, because I know I went back and watched it several times. Uh, at the same time and on top of that i think people like myself do underestimate the power even amongst average film fans that the name pixar brings mm -hmm. along with it and so while somebody like me i thought maybe tops honestly i thought pixar should be happy if this movie hits 400 million worldwide which is a huge mega hit but at 700 million, I didn't think it would do that simply because of how hard it is to market a film like this. Now, Schnepp, are you surprised by it, or why do you think it was able to succeed? I mean, I'm I'm surprised by it. I I saw it. And I, I thought it was okay. It was like to me, I didn't like it as much as all these other Pixar movies. It's still a good film, but when you when you say the word Pixar, you equate it to like Toy Story three or Up or like all these amazing films that are like of this the, you know upper quality. And this was to me at least. A little too simplistic when you're talking about the mind whatever i'm a super nerd or whatever you want to say it's like it just it like that every single brain had the same set of these five emotions it just bothered me so what you know aside from these like you know minor quibbles you might say <laughs> i like the the ghost friend what was his name oingo boingo or bing bong bing, bing bong. bong sorry <laughs> bing bong. Who's your friend? Oingo. Oingo. Bing bong. He's just bing bong. an imaginary but he's not a ghost he's yeah like Casper. a little you know your little fake friend you know whatever <laughs> I never had a ghost. He was real to me, and he made a lot of people cry in <laughs> no, the theater I saw. Yes, it. he yeah. did. Bing Bong got me a little emotional now that I'm thinking back about it. You know, with the little whoo, boom. Take you know? her to the moon yeah. for me. Take her to the moon, right? Richard Kind, your favorite actor, right, Mark? <laughs> right, I, Richard Kind's great. He's, he's hilarious. You guys drink Coors Light together, right? <laughs> he's from New Jersey. I think he hits yeah, the hard yeah, stuff. He's hitting it hard. So, yeah, I mean, I was actually surprised that it made this much money, but good for them. You know, I'd lo I love it when quality companies make a lot of money because that means that mean they're going to make more movies. So, Shay, did you have a chance to I see? Did. What did you think about um, it? Well, when you were saying the word of mouth, I spoke to you and you were raving about it, and I went and watched it that day because I was like, oh my gosh, this movie has to be amazing. I thought it was okay. Like, really? I, I really did. I liked it. I've watched it twice. I liked it. It's a it's an easy movie to watch, but I think that's kind of why I thought it was okay because it is it is pretty simple and the whole each of those you know emotions having the same vibe that bugged me too. I don't know why, but I was like, wait, if we're trying to focus in on these emotions, they're all kind of thinking the same, and it just it got under my skin just a little bit. But I think. I am surprised. I think word of mouth was it. I think that people, it just pulled on certain people's heartstrings and it is a very mature movie, I, which is why I thought it wouldn't do as well because it yeah. is like, where, what age group are we talking about here where it's like, like a Wally -E too, where I was like, who, are, who what five-year-old is going to totally understand just how deep this movie is? Mm -hmm. But it's more like this eight, nine, ten-year-old like as you start really thinking for yourself. But I think the reason why I did so well, honestly, is just people 
raving about this movie. I can't stand Wally. That's like Johnny Five singing show tunes. I can't watch that movie at all. But Pixar, <laughs> what they do with Inside Out, that thing's going to be a monster on Blu-ray, too. Yeah. I had a chance to see Riley's First Date, which mm. is a short that's going to be attached oh. to the Blu-ray. Yeah. Right. So the fact that we've established this universe, it opens up so much potential for everything that a teenage girl would go through. And Make people sure you check like it out. little characters like that, too. Yeah. Kids love, oh, you know what I'm saying? Like genius, minions, yeah. like these things that look like you want to squeeze them. I swear to God, like that has got to be a huge part of like the success of some of these movies because that's like toys just waiting to happen, you well, know? There's a sequence in the film, I won't say where it happens, but where we kind of zoom into everybody else's mind and we get a little moment. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. I gotta say that was like my favorite part of the film and you know, without spoilers or anything, it was like, I wish they had so much more of that, especially the the sequence with the cats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's so, yeah, that I, made so that much sense That whole sequence, I thought, I thought there were a, a, a number of good laughs throughout the film, but to me the hardest laugh I had, and I won't say the setup for it, but girl, girl, girl. <laughs> that, <laughs> I, I, for those of you who seen the movie, you know what I'm yeah. talking about. I, I almost <laughs> fell out of my seat. I was laughing so hard at that. Yeah. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. If whenever Sinead's got a few other items in the world of movie news, she's going to run them down. And those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell. So, Sinead, what do we got? The first trailer for the new documentary, All Things Must Pass, has hit the web. Directed by Colin Hanks, yes, Tom Hanks' son, the film chronicles the rise of Tower Records from its explosive inception to its eventual demise. And while everyone blames the internet for the end of the iconic music store, Hanks digs into the real story behind the end of an institution. How did Tower go from a billion dollar a year business to bankruptcy in a very short window of time? Schnepp, do you buy or sell this trailer for All Things Must Pass? I buy this uh, trailer heavily. It it looks really, really interesting. And it's something that uh, really has affected everyone that I know. Not just Tower Records closing. That was the very first death knell to every one of these individualized, like even borders where, you know, people would go and it's like it was it's the 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 shopping and kind of milling about and being able to look at physical media as we enter this whole other realm that we're moving into where that's not even important anymore. I mean, you've seen the rebirth of vinyl. To a certain degree, we have, you know, with DJs and now it's becoming a cool thing to play vinyl again, which I think is great. But are we ever going to have a Tower Records again? No. And it's a, I think this is really indicative of a certain time. And if you want to learn about the history of how Napster affected the whole globe as far as sales of, of just vinyl and records in the music industry, and then now we've got torrents that are affecting the movie industry, it's the same exact thing. So, you know, I'm very much looking forward to it. I remember we uh, it was uh, just a few days ago an email got passed across my desk about if we were interested in talking to Colin Hanks about this new movie and I remember thinking ah, it's you know yeah the Napster came along the digital age came that's what happened but then you watch this trailer and you know you see Bruce Springsteen in there you see Elton John in there and, and you see them talking about the impression I get both from the synopsis and the trailers that hey everybody just assumed it was Napster that did it but there was actually a bigger story going on mm -hmm. behind the scenes that did it. And suddenly this story, I love when movies can take isolated stories like Tower Records, the story, and find the drama that lies within there and bring it out as a narrative and bring it out as a story. And I got to tell you, the trailer totally sold me. I went from being, eh, it sounds like a, to wow. This feels like something I got to see. So for me, the trailer's a big buy. It's a huge buy for me. I'm a huge fan of music documentaries. If you haven't seen this, this echoes back to things that I've seen recently, like the Muscle Shoals documentary or a studio uh, Sound City that Dave Grohl did. It's it's that kind of feeling where you want to know the history of something like that. You take out the history of Tower Records, but also just the changing of the guard, like what you guys referenced, how physical media, it went from uh, vinyl to cassette to CD and then magic. And then all of a sudden, yeah. it's this digital age where you don't need to go anywhere. There's two landmark places in Los Angeles. One was Tower Records. The other one is Amoeba. And Amoeba's still there largely because they sell vinyl. And there's been a resurgence in vinyl. And Tower Records never got that opportunity. When I first moved to Hollywood, one of the landmarks that I got to see, I, I walked by Tower Records. And I'm like, oh, this is, this is the mm -hmm. Tower Records. So I'm fascinated by this documentary. I can't wait to see it. You know, one of the things that it does bring to my mind, too, you mentioned Amoeba. If you live anywhere in or around Hollywood or visited Hollywood, chance are or watch the opening to Entourage. You've seen Amoeba <laughs> Records. Yeah. It is it is a landmark in this town. I often every time I go past it though, I often wonder how much longer 
How much it's longer? It's always can popping it... off, though. Oh, like, yeah. There's yeah. All, and they're, they do shows and stuff there, too, which they've helps. They've expanded yeah. themselves. Right. Yeah, right. To, to cover a lot of things and stuff like that. They've handled it and really there, well. There's not that many of them. They're so mm-hmm. franchise all over the place. I think there's only three Amoebas. There's one in San Francisco and uh, here in L.A., and I think there's one somewhere else. I can't remember. Yeah, I think there's one in Pasadena, too. Fun fact about the Tower Records used to be in L.A. David Lee Roth, they actually built a skyscraper, like a mountain for him to climb on top of Tower Records to promote his album Skyscraper. That was like the height of the uh-huh. 80s and excess and everything. It was just a really cool, I'll Instagram the picture. It's awesome to look at. All right, what's next? As many of you know, director Ridley Scott has plans to shoot a sequel to his 2012 film Prometheus, and it looks like plans are moving ahead to start sooner rather than later. According to an interview in Empire, the director claimed that he is already heavy at work on pre-production on the film and has confirmed that it is his next project. This interview seems to confirm earlier rumors that Scott petitioned Fox Studios to push back the Neil Bloomkamp Alien 5 project to allow Prometheus 2 to shoot and hit theaters first. John, do you buy or sell Prometheus 2 happening sooner than expected? I am going to buy it, and the reason, but it's a weird reason I'm buying it, considering I don't like Prometheus, and I'm not particularly interested in Prometheus 2. Um, but considering Ridley Scott's, you know, assertion that he wants to distance Prometheus from aliens. He wants. He doesn't want people to think alien when they see Prometheus. He almost wants to make it a totally different franchise. He's already said that we're not even going to see any of the aliens in uh, in the new Prometheus at all. He wants to separate himself from that. And we mentioned this when that first rumor came out that um, that it looked like Neil Blomkamp was pressuring Fox to push back Alien 5 so he can get Prometheus 2 out first because he's worried that if Alien 5 comes out first, then people are just going to be thinking Alien again with Prometheus, and he wants to separate that. So it is the right move. Now, I will say this. I'm not looking forward to Prometheus 2 because I did not like the first one at all. However, even though Ridley Scott has been on a dry spell, and that's, to put it mildly, I've talked to a couple people who have seen The Martian. And the word so far is quite good. Ooh. So if he can if he can hit one out of the park with the Martian, my whole you know position on Prometheus two may change. If Ridley Scott is back, then I may change my. For now, it's for now I'm still not looking forward to it. But the idea of putting it first, I got to buy it. Well, I I was a fan of Prometheus, and I I thought he was back with that film, really well directed, a lot of story issues and points. Uh, didn't make sense in some ways, but I, I was able to, you know, surpass that. I really enjoyed it, and I was looking forward to Prometheus 2, worried that they weren't going to make it. So I'm really excited, and I'm also excited that they are pushing Alien 5, because I do agree that if Pro- Alien 5 came out and then Prometheus 2, it would be weird. Mm. But I don't think that you will not see the alien in, in Prometheus 2. I think, think? He, I think he's playing games, because when, when Prometheus, when they were talking about Prometheus, he said it has nothing to do with Alien. Was what he was saying, and then all of a sudden you're, oh, what's what's the engineers and all this other stuff? That's all about alien. So it is all about alien. But what I thought, I think, what really wants to do is establish, you know, a really firm, good story before we move to Alien Five, and and the possibility of Alien Five derailing what he's trying to do with Prometheus Two. It makes sense. So I'm really excited about this. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a buy for me. I'd like to see a Prometheus Two, like you, uh, Schnapp. I really enjoyed Prometheus, and I'm going to make John's Canadian blood boil a little bit because I felt the same way about Prometheus that I did about Man of Steel, where there's some issues with the movie, but it's set up a universe that I want to go back to very soon. And the move makes sense that there that these in pre-production now he wants Prometheus 2 to come out before Alien 5. That's also, by the way, a huge help to Neil Blomkamp. Blomkamp, Sinead? Blomkamp. Bloom, Bloom to Neil Blomkamp. Because, look, that dude could use a break. He could just use some time to really... Chappy. Just, just, just <laughs> get a good story for Alien 5. We don't need to rush Alien 5 back into theaters. This is your shot, man. Right. So I wanted them to take as much time with the story and all that stuff as possible. In the meantime, get Prometheus out. Let us see what that world is going to look like. It's going to be a bummer not seeing any Xenomorphs in Prometheus 2. I don't think you're going to. But it's going to be a nice setup to see Alien 5 again. And then maybe we get more Prometheus films if the second one is great. Dude, you are totally going to see a xenomorph. They had one in Prometheus. There's a big, like, weird statue of it, like, right above yeah, all those I, weird I think canisters. he's right. I, I believe I believe him in this one. I believe he, he means what he says. He wants to distance this movie from, from the xenomorphs. I don't think we're going to see one in the new movie at all. You might see, all. like, a skeleton, like a no trophy way. or something I, like that, but you're not going to have a xenomorph attack. You are going to have a full one. <laughs> all right. <laughs> we, got, we got a little bit of time before we find out that. All right, folks, listen. <laughs> it's Friday, which means it's time for us to make our box office predictions brought to you by our friends 
at AMC theaters. Now, last week, we all completely botched it. Other than, you know, getting straight out of Compton was going to be number one, <laughs> which we all did pretty well on. Other than that, we didn't do so well last week. So it's time again for us to take a run and take a shot at this. Now, we've got a couple of new movies entering the fray. We've got No Escape entering the fray. We've got We, we Are Your Friends entering the fray here. So I will go first right. this week, all right? Coming in at number one at this week's box office for the third week in a row will be Straight out of Compton. Coming in at number two will be We Are Your Friends because nothing else is strong enough <laughs> to, to come above it. Coming in third spot, I believe, is going to be Mission Impossible uh, Rogue Nation. Coming in fourth spot will be No Escape. And coming in fifth spot will be Man from Uncle. So those are my uh, box office right. shows. What about you, Schnapp? All right. First, I'll give my fake one. Coming out in number one is No Escape. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number two, Transporter. Number three. Well, Transporter's not opening this week. Oh, bummer. All right. Well, forget my fake ones. All right. So number one, straight out of Compton. I'm going to go number two, Mission Impossible. Number three, Man from Uncle. And number four, uh, <laughs> uh, let's say Ant-Man. And... Uh, <laughs> Number good. five, the resurgence, <laughs> Sinister Two. <laughs> All right, what about you, Mark? I'm going to take Campia's list. It sounds like you've had a few Coors Lights. I'm going to take Campia's list, <laughs> except I'm going to take number five out, and I'm going to put I'm going to put yeah. Sinister Two in that spot nice. instead of what do you have at number five? I had Man from Uncle in my number five. Yeah, spot. I'm going to put Sinister Two in there instead of Man from Uncle. But everything else, I think you're right. I think uh, I think We Are Your Friends is going to be the strongest of the newcomers. It's just not quite going to take over straight out of Compton, and nor should it. <laughs> All right. All right, folks, it's that time of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can just email it to us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Send in your questions. Let's see if we can get it on the show. So, Sinead, what do we got picked out? Dan writes, hey, Collider crew, love the show. So I've been watching Rebels, and I love it, and I've been noticing how Ezra has some dark side characteristics to him. Fear, anger, revenge, etc. So with that being said, why can't he be Kylo Ren? Timeline and age seem to fit. We see Adam Driver in a Rebel outfit. Maybe Kanan dies, and Luke picks him up and trains him. Luke may run the Knights of Ren. Then on the side, he helps the Rebels. <laughs> till he crash lands, and Snoke picks him up. It also gives weight to the story of them casting a girl as a solo kid. Maybe Ray and her will be the twins. What are your thoughts? Thanks, and keep up the great work. Well, just go to one of the, the first parts of the thing. You, you, the timeline and age absolutely do not work. They do not work at all. Ezra, how old are we saying Ezra is in, in, in Rebels? Say like, around 14, 15. 14, 15. He's got his driver's permit. Yeah. So it's like 14 or 15. Now it's about five years separated from episode four. Mm -hmm. So now you're looking at about Luke's age. He's like 18, 19, 20 on the top end, right? About three or four years, they say, separates episode um, four and the end of episode six. So now you're looking about 23, 24. And then you're looking at 30 years from episode six to episode seven. Now you're looking at a guy who's 53, 54, 55. That ain't Adam Driver. That's uh, that's not Kylo Ren. So I, I don't think now if it wasn't for that issue, it would make great sense, because if you watch Rebels and I hope a lot of you do, because it's a really solid show. If you watch Rebels and if you watch Jedi Council, even more importantly, you know, Mark and Christian, and I we've been saying for a long time, hey, look, bad things are coming because None of these people are going to make it out of this show. If you know Star Wars, when the, the environment and landscape, when Episode uh, 4 comes along, there ain't no more Jedi in the galaxy and bad things are coming. And so the idea that Ezra turns dark, you're right, in the show, they make a lot of allusions to the fact that he's got anger, he's got hate issues, he's got you know all these types of things. And Kanan's a little bit worried about him. Him turning dark side is something I'm anticipating. But it doesn't fit him being Kylo Ren. It doesn't match up. So I, I don't think so. Mark, uh, as a fellow Jedi counselist, what do you think about this? If Ezra's going to be Kylo Ren, kid, you got to start moisturizing yesterday because <laughs> you look great for 53. I don't think that's going to be the case, but I like where Dan Lockhart's head is at, where you want to connect Rebels to The Force Awakens somehow. Rebels is going to be connecting a lot more, I think, with Rogue One. Um, but like you said, I just ha I have a bad feeling about this. When you're talking about any of these characters making it into a cinematic Star Wars universe, because I know it's all canon, but a lot of these people, maybe they're on Alderaan when Alderaan blows up. Maybe 
uh, Kanan and Ezra are helping the Rebels steal the Death Star plans in Rogue One, and that is the fate that befells them. Maybe, just maybe, Ezra and Kanan just take off and they're hiding out somewhere on like a Dagobah distant planet during the events of the classic trilogy, so people weren't aware that there were other Force-sensitive people out there in the galaxy somewhere. There's so many possibilities with here. I know you and Christian have cooked up a lot of theories that maybe Ezra or Kanan could be in The Force Awakens as an older character like a Max von Sydow or somebody like that. I don't think you're going to see either one of those names brought up in the new movie, but in Rogue One, you're definitely going to see ties to Rebels. What about uh, what about him being one of the Knights of Neep? <laughs> it's Ren. Knights Constantly of Ren. hunting for shrubberies. Right. <laughs> Ezra, go get me some more shrubberies. <laughs> All right, what's next? Jerry writes, thank you for taking my question. I check out some of the boards on IMDb and I get a chuckle at some of the comments. Not that their opinions really matter, but do you feel like there is a turn on Nolan and his amazing Batman trilogy? It seems like the people who worship Bale as Batman have turned on him and now are saying that Affleck is the better Batman and we haven't even we haven't seen more than the trailers. I hate that. I hate the either or mentality. I like both and I appreciate multiple interpretations of the character. It seems like Nolan is getting hate for setting the tone for DC movies. Even Snyder mentioned that the new DCEU is the legacy of Nolan's Batman films. To summarize, it seems like a few years ago, Nolan and Bale were praised for their Batman movies and now they're getting flack. Yeah, I mean, it, this kind of highlights a thing that goes around in, in all movie fandom circles and outside of movie fandom circles, but it's really highlighted in the comic book movie fandom circles. Um, it seems like you pointed out in your email, there's an either or mentality. There's a mentality that you're not allowed to like one thing and like another. You're not allowed to say this thing's great and say something else is also great. There seems to be this idea. And, and what we do is, it's a human trait, I guess. It's like to justify me liking product A, I have to talk crap about product B because there's no other way to do it. I can't say, hey, yeah, product B is a really good product, but my preference is product A. It, there doesn't seem to be tell. So there's, there's a big movement of people out there. And I am one of these people that is really has high hopes for Batman versus Superman. We love what we've, see, we've seen so far. We think the casting, you know, Ben Affleck and all that kind of stuff was great. We believe in it. We think it's going to be good. Good. But then comes this mentality that, oh, well, for us to justify that we're looking forward to it, let's start talking crap about the Christopher Nolan Batman films, which I've never understood. And it, especially in the whole DC films versus Marvel film thing, you know, people who are DC movie fans or want DC films to be great, they don't know how to do it without talking crap about Marvel. It's like, like I, when I have discussions with somebody about, you know, can this DC movie be good or can this DC movie be good? And they start out the conversation, well, Avengers really sucks. Well, now you've lost me. Now I'm not even going to listen to anything you say because clearly you're out of your mind. I mean, all film is subjective, but clearly what you're doing now is just trying to crap on something else to try to justify your position. You can acknowledge greatness in other things and still think your thing is better and embrace it and love it and just be happy with all of it. But yeah, I have seen, I have also noticed this real trend lately of uh, retro crap talk on Nolan's Batman. Look, everybody knows I did not like the, uh, I, I, no, I, no I, I liked it. I liked The Dark Knight Returns or The Dark Knight Rises was the name of the last one. Uh, I liked it, but I was really let down by it. I thought it was by far the weakest of the Batman trilogy. But overall, that Christopher Nolan Batman trilogy was a game changer. It was great. It was magnificent. came real close. It I mean, won a couple of Academy Awards for in their series. I, I don't understand this retro nitpicking now that we're past it all to justify our optimism for the new films. You're allowed to love both folks. Uh, that's what I tell my wife about my three girlfriends. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Schnapp, what do you think? Well, this reminds Jeez. me of uh, <laughs> Star Trek versus Star Wars. I mean, there's like, yeah. people always have to pick sides, and I, I love both Star Wars and Star Trek. And for me, it's like I love Adam West as much as I like Michael Keaton. You know, it's like, uh, and I think Christian Bale did a great job as Batman. You know, the other two were in one movie, so it's harder to gauge. Here you got Ben Affleck. I, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing his version of Batman. I, I never, I never like, you know, poop on the other, you know, whoever the other roles were. You know, you're always going to have different people playing these roles. So I, you know, I don't understand the instant all of a sudden turnaround hatred on Bale or Nolan. 
stupid. Yeah, um, just before we go on, uh, my, my text messages are blowing up here from my wife. If either of you guys have a couch I can sleep on tonight, that would be uh, fantastic. Thank you. Anyway, Mark, your thoughts <laughs> on this whole thing. I just felt a wave of panic because I thought you were checking and people were texting you that there's a new story. <laughs> <I was. laughs> Break I open the, the cord light. Right. Break it open. It's time to drink six of them. <laughs> That's the thing, though. Is like, look, I can love Coors Light and Stone IPA the same, okay? <laughs> and I can love the Bale Batman and the Affleck Batman. What this is, I think it's a, it's a mixture of excitement for the new Batman and seeing a different kind of Batman than we've ever seen before because Bale was basically the same level as, as Bruce Wayne, as was Michael Keaton, as was Adam West, and even Clooney and Val Kilmer. But now we get to see a Batman who was in retirement and is actually coming out of retirement. It's a totally different Batman. So people are excited about that. And then, like John alluded to, The Dark Knight Rises, the last third of that movie really left a sour taste in my mouth. And, and it just wasn't, it wasn't the walk-off home run that I wanted it to be because those first two Nolan Batman films right. are two of my favorite comic book movies, favorite, my favorite movies in general of all time. So seeing it kind of limp out as opposed to running out and just being the best of the three, it's it hurts it a little bit, but I think it, when people really look back at those films, they're just going to see nothing but greatness, and that's why it should be. I I am I, I, I seriously am sitting here going through my Twitter feed just seeing if a new Star Wars trailer has dropped yet. <laughs> a new Star Wars trailer. We dropped? still got a couple more questions to go. We have a few more minutes. <laughs> Let's extend the episode. You know it's going to drop <laughs> in three minutes. I'm like quickly. Sam. <laughs> What's <right>? next? <laughs> Sam writes. I was just wondering why some older actors get more recognition than others. For example, I was born in '93. Holla. And growing up, everyone my age <laughs> knew who Jack Nicholson, Robert De Niro, and Clint Eastwood were, but no one knew anything about other legendary actors like Dustin Hoffman, Gene Hackman, and Al Pacino. Why is it that some of cinema's greats are not as well known to today's audiences as others? Well, I, I can say back in, in uh, you know, 2000, 2010, you no know, people knew who Al Pacino is. And But you're right. I think a lot of the younger audience don't realize who Dustin Hoffman is, like the great Dustin Hoffman. There are some people who don't really realize who Gene Hackman is um, and all that kind of stuff. I think the reason is because up till a number of years ago, uh, Jack Nicholson was still quite active. You know, Robert De Niro has always stayed very active. Clint Eastwood is always very active. He's not acting, he's directing. And he's up at the Academy mm -hmm. Awards and he's all that kind of stuff. So when you look at Hackman, who's who's de facto retired, when you look at a guy like Dustin Hoffman, who does very few things right now, only when he kind of feels like it, does little things like Chef or whatever. But for the most part, he keeps himself out of the limelight. So I think the reason a lot of some younger generation today will recognize certain older generation names is because those older generation names are still active. And the ones that they are not really familiar with are the ones that are no longer active. I think that's a shame, but it's it's understandable at the same time, too. I don't know, Schnepp, how would you answer that? I think wherever you grew up, Spink, uh, your, your friends weren't watching movies. That's all I could say. It's like, because <laughs> you got to watch the French Connection. You got to watch the conversation to know who Gene Hackman is. Yeah, Gene Hackman is not active now. You're totally right. So that's what happens with every single set of a decade of actors and directors and writers is they disappear as the next set of new people come in, new Hollywood, fresh talent. That's just how it is. So in order to find out about these people, like you did, you probably had to go and do some homework and research and watch some of the older films, like Kramer versus Kramer for Dustin Hoffman. I think Dustin Hoffman's last hit was Rain Man, and that was over 20 years ago. So, you know, that's just Tootsie. how it is. Was that? Oh, Tootsie. Tootsie. But that was, but Gotta that was 30 watch years Tootsie. ago. Yeah. I'm just saying, it's like, it makes sense. His question isn't crazy. It's just... That's exactly how it works. No, it does. Yeah, it's, it's it's a young person writing the question, and maybe they saw Mr. Megorium's Wonder Emporium and was like, who the hell is this nut <laughs> on the screen? But I, I think that when you're a kid today, you just have more homework to do. Because everybody starts out, and you probably see the same movies. You probably see The Wizard of Oz, and you see Star Wars, and you see a lot of animated features. And then you get older, and you get into film, and you're like, okay, well, what am I going to get into? Stuff that's coming out right now. I want to go see this movie and this movie and all these comic book movies and action movies. And then, eventually, you want to see more. And so then you have to go back into the cat. Catalog, but that catalog for me, when I was a child of the 80s and the 90s, is a lot less extensive than somebody who's just coming into their own now and seeing how much they love movies and doing the research. But you should definitely know who Gene Hackman, Al Pacino, and Dustin Hoffman are. Hackman, it, it, sadly, he's retired, but that guy is just, he's one of my favorite actors of all time, even more so than De Niro and Pacino. I love, love, love Gene Hackman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you're looking at things like Hoosiers, like even beyond, obviously, French Connection, those classic Hoosiers, he was for 
several generations our understanding of Lex Luthor. He mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. Lex Luthor. I mean, but you know what I think his last film was? I have to look this up to be sure. I think his last film was actually comedy everybody hated, but I actually didn't Heartbreakers? mind. Heartbreakers? Heartbreakers. No, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't hate it either. I thought it was fun. Who was the girl from Jennifer, Jennifer Love, Love Hewitt. Hewitt. With Jennifer yeah. Love Hewitt. I actually thought that was a cute uh, I, I like don't want to on anybody's like parade, but I believe the film... Welcome to Mooseport With was Ray. the last time we think, saw Gene Hackman. Do you think that came screen. after Heartbreakers? Did that come after? It, it definitely came after Heartbreakers. You yeah, might that you sure might be right. That that rings true. I'm not arguing me. with this Gene Hackman lover. He knows. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, that'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Videos Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget. Lots of great films are playing over at our friends at AMC Theaters. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. If you want an audio-only version of this episode, just check your favorite podcast app, search for Collider Video, and you should be able to find our podcast there. Of course, the most important thing, obviously, is subscribe to this YouTube channel. If you're not a subscriber yet, click that subscribe button. Keep up to date with all the movie talks, heroes, Jedi councils, mailbags, and now we got some TV stuff coming, too, which we're all very excited about follow us on facebook twitter check out our instagram account of course at collider video wendy's always putting stuff up there as well i want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me first of all sitting over here mr john schnepp schnepp where can people find you online you guys can find me on twitter and instagram just at john schnepp and at tdoslwh you can also find clips of gene hackman in my documentary the death of superman lives playing yes. <laughs> death of superman lives what happened he's playing lex luther you can check that out you can rent it or get a blu-ray at www.tdoslwh.com Thanks. Over here, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you drinking Coors Light? You can find a lot of pictures of me with a Coors Light online. Twitter, Instagram, at 5150 Ellis. Next weekend, I'm going to be in Kansas City, Missouri at the Improv. Come out, say hi. And, of course, our lovely host today, Ms. Sinead DeFries, who only drinks Jack. Sinead, where can people find you? <laughs> That's right. When I'm not watering my plants with Coors Light. Oh. <laughs> Bam! Bam! Boom! I'm online on Twitter and Instagram making fun of Mark Ellis at Sinead DeFries and at that's so Sinead.com. And, of course, you can just follow me on the various social media networks on Facebook or on Twitter, just at John Campia. Thanks a lot for joining us, guys. My name is John Campia for Collider Video, and until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>